thank you, Andy, for having me here today and organizing this wonderful session. Um, I think compared to the rest, I'm actually a bit of an imposter because my rock art isn't prehistoric. It's actually historic. We have writing along with it, um, but I hopefully it'll still be interesting nonetheless. Um, and I've also I've changed my title a little bit, actually. Um, <laughs> you know, that's that's my fault. Because I, uh, when I was making this presentation, I realized I'd been too ambitious with my abstract and wanted to discuss too many things. So I'm going to now focus a little bit more just on the Chena Poitoir aspects. And uh, this rock art is part of my uh, PhD research at Leiden University. Uh, and I'm part of a, a larger project, Landscapes of Survival. And maybe some of you saw my colleague presenting yesterday. And uh, we're looking at the Black Desert uh, archaeology in Jordan. But I'll, uh, I'll get back to that a little bit later. Um, so to talk about Chien Apertoire, I want to first talk about materiality. And uh, I won't go into a lot of details because most of you are probably aware of this material turn in uh, not only in archaeology, but in, more specifically in this case in rock art research. Um, but just to give a little bit of background, it basically it, it advocates that we move away from a representational approach and an iconographical approach so basically away from looking at the image and the art. And instead it says we should move towards um, engaging with uh, rock art as an archaeological material and thus that we look at the medium, the rock itself, which means engaging with the modes of production and how the carvers interacted with the rock. But also looking at context, so the, the micro landscape of the panel, uh, the macro landscape, the larger context around it, and of course then interweaving this with the social context. An important part of this is, of course, the chaîne au portoir, uh, a method that's been employed for other archaeological materials for, for decades, but uh, has only really recently made it into rock art research. Um, but it's a very interesting way of uh, getting at this production of rock art through looking at how is it made, which tools, how long did it take, um, and um, how could they have possibly made these different images. And so interwoven in this is a, an approach that I've been <clears throat> reading about recently that's inspired me. And that's the microarchaeological approach uh, that's been uh, promoted by uh, Frederick Fallander. And it, it talks about how in archaeology in general, but definitely also in rock art research, we need to start looking from a more detailed, small scale um, perspective, looking bottom up. So working from in archaeology from a site perspective upwards uh, or from uh, rock art, working from um, the, like I said already, the production, the context, rather than working from these broad, large-scale, general theories and ideas, and then placing these on our material. And it's an uh, approach that's very valuable to my research, because the, um, the area I'm working in, we know very little about the societies, and they've always been studied from a very long-term, broad-scale um, perspective, very much top-down from external historical sources. And at the same time, the rock art has never been systematically studied before. It's all been, um, the image has basically just been cherry-picked from across the Black Desert to fit into what we know from these historical sources. So oh, they, must, they were camel herders and they did hunt because look, they've got here, there's an image of a camel and there, there are some people hunting. So I think that's why, for my own research, this approach would also be very useful to get a new perspective. But just uh, before I go into that, give you an idea of where we are in the world. Uh, this is uh, Jordan and the Black Desert, which is this uh, large brown uh, kind of blob that goes down from southern Syria into uh, northern Saudi Arabia. And just to give you an impression, this is what it looks like. It's the, um, these dark basalt hills up here, and then uh, limestone plains around it. And we find uh, the rock art everywhere, but especially up on these high areas. And uh, the rock art is found throughout the Black Desert. I have no idea how much, but there must be tens of thousands of petroglyphs. Uh, we're working in a, a little area here uh, called Jebel Kurma. You can see it. And uh, in our research area, we have more than 3,000 petroglyphs. Um, as of yet, we'll probably get more. And just to give you an idea, these are the types of uh, images we have. Lots and lots and lots of camels, especially, which is great. 
And although it's found throughout the Black Desert, uh, there's actually a very sort of strict recurrent pattern of what kind of images we see. So just to give you an idea, like I said, the camel is already, it's more than 50% of all my motifs. But we also get wild animals, ibexes, oryxes, lions, um, other domestic animals as horses and of course some geometric symbols and these lovely lady figures um, which are quite rare actually and very uniquely for rock art in general uh, we find them with uh, inscriptions associated with inscriptions um, in uh, what's called the Safiitic script sort of proto-arabic and it's a very unique source of information for studying the rock art because they, on the one hand, give us a unique glimpse into the lives of these carvers. Sometimes they mention uh, activities such as pasturing, uh, but also mourning for loved ones. And they also claim authorship to the drawings sometimes. So, for example, this one here says, by so-and-so is the he camel. And, well, there's the male camel. So that's, that's great. That's great for us. Um, but at the same time, they are sort of the source of many of the problems as well. Um, first of all, because of the dating, um, they've been tentatively date to 1st century BC to the 4th century AD, but there are a lot of problems with this dating that I won't go into now. And the rock art's been just sort of shoved into the same uh, dating period uh, because they're found with them sometimes. And um, the only people who have been working in this area so far have been epigraphists who were only interested in the inscriptions and the pretty pictures, so the beautiful horses, and for the rest, uh, the rocker hasn't been studied. So this means that all the theories we have at the moment are all based on the inscriptions and have sort of just been, by extension, placed on the rock art. And uh, one of the main dominant theories at the moment is that it's all graffiti. So it's these inscriptions and these, these, uh, these images, they're carved in the long, boring hours of being a nomad, uh, looking at your camel pasturing down below, and so then you sort of doodle on a rock, is, is the idea. So, um, but at the same, also, um, apart from the fact that we have a lot of um, similar motifs uh, ever across the Black Desert, we also have the same recurrent techniques coming back. And uh, mostly, almost all of the images are, are hammered, mostly using indirect percussion. The difference is sometimes difficult to, uh, to see on this, on this type of rock, but we do have a few, uh, a minority of, of, um, of indirect uh, percussion. Sorry, I said the wrong way around. We have mostly direct percussion and a few rare examples of indirect. And then we also have uh, incised uh, figures, and they're often combined, as you can see here, this nice archer who's been uh, hammered, and then he's got a, an incised arrow and bow, and I think it's a bit difficult to see, but he's got a quiver on his back, and these sort of stick-like legs. So they combine all these techniques as well. And in general, the incised ones are quite simple, but they can also be quite complicated, such as this one, which I find it's a very beautiful one, this checkered horse. Uh, with a man uh, sitting on top holding a spear, spearing what looks to be an, an oryx. And so these different techniques and the way they're used, they produce a, a, quite a variety of results that, at least to our modern eyes, appear in sort of different degrees of uh, aesthetically pleasing or not, not saying anything about how that was in the past. But I think what gets even more interesting about these techniques is when we delve into the chaîne opératoire. Um, so I was in the Black Desert for the first time this spring, and uh, being there, sort of engaging with the material one-on-one, -on -one, um, it brought something to my attention which I hadn't noticed uh, when looking through thousands and thousands of photographs of these, uh, of these petroglyphs. And uh, it's this beautiful camel here that made me realize it, actually. As you can see here, we can just see the nice camel itself, um, but if we look very closely, you can see these incised lines running alongside of it. I've just highlighted them. I hope it makes it a bit clearer. So you've got one here, which is very clear, a little one up here, and then this one down here, which is a little bit less convincing. But what it looks like is that they've started making the camel on the, here, realized there probably wasn't enough space for the head, and then moved on a little bit more to the left. But what gets even more fascinating is that these lines are incised. 
Whereas the camel, the, the sort of the final draft, if you want to call it that, has been hammered. So this would suggest that they start out using thin, easy incisions to sort of make an outline or even a sketch, if you want to call it that, before then hammering over it to make the final product. And once I saw this, and luckily that was in my first week there, so that was good because then I could uh, use that the rest of the weeks. Uh, I started. I started to notice it in a lot of other images as well. So I've just got a nice. This is a one of the biggest camels we have. And if you look closely at his neck, you see this again an incision line running alongside of it. That it looks like they maybe just didn't quite pound over it properly. And there are a lot of uh, of these types of examples. We have also ones that uh, look like they have, there's also been a very deliberate outline made. So again, another dromedary camel. And if we zoom in on his belly, we see it's maybe a little bit difficult to see, but you've got this slightly thicker, more pronounced line running out on the outside. And this gives me the impression that they, again, they made an outline first and then they filled it in. And using this theory, um, this theory of how they maybe produce this rock art gets verified when we then find some unfinished motifs, which are really, I guess, yeah, if you're looking at technique, then that's the, that's the amazing thing to find. So we've got this guy here, this camel, who's uh, fortunately been superimposed by a much more recent one here. But if we look at his hump, we can see that this part's been pounded. But here you see all these incised lines. So it looks like, again, they made these incisions, making an outline, pounded over it, and didn't finish it off for some reason uh, or another. But then, of course, the question then comes into mind, why did they make it this way? I mean, why did they, um, as it were, sketch it first or make an outline first? And um, of course, this uh, then, as a researcher, gets you thinking. And um, the first thing that pops into my head is, well, if you make me draw a camel, would I do that first? Would I just go ahead and start making a camel? Or would I sketch an outline first, plan where I want it to be on the paper? Because I'm not a very good artist, so whenever I try to make something, then I end up splodging it all on the right side of somewhere and then realizing that I should have started much more to the left. So it, it, it got me thinking about this aspect of, of planning and of thinking out what you want to do and also thinking about what you want it to, the final product to look like. And I think an interesting clue comes that when we look at the actual final image. So we've got a great uh, image here of a, a mother camel being led by this little man here, and then there's a baby camel, infant camel nursing. Um, and the very interesting thing is when we measure the camels, especially the ones associated with Safietic inscriptions, so we know they're Safiatic. They have uh, very interesting proportions. They're, if we measure the height of the camel and the, and the length, they're nearly always a one-to-one -one ratio. So if the height is 17 centimeters, the, the length is 16. And so they always have this sort of perfect proportion in the way they look. And also if we look at them just sort of aesthetically, stylistically, there's also a pattern in the way that they appear. Now, I haven't satisfactorily sort of really determined what this style is yet. It's just uh, these patterns that have started to occur to me. But the hump's always depicted in one of a few ways. And this is a very typical round hump. But you also have ones that are perfect bell shapes. Uh, the legs are always depicted in a very particular way. The muzzle is always either very simplistic or it's got this little sort of rounded down uh, aspect. And so this gives uh, the idea that the camels were meant to look in a particular way. And um, this becomes more, we can contrast this with the way that the, the rock art, the more recent ones, medieval, post-medieval, and even 1970s uh, images of camels look like, then we get something like this. And that's <coughs> completely different. So um, there is a real, Safiatic style, if you want to call it that way. Um, and also, this isn't defined by the anatomy of the animal, for example, because a camel is always much longer than it is tall. 
So this one-to-one -one ratio doesn't, anatomically doesn't make any sense. So it seems instead that there was a certain convention or standard to adhere to when carving a camel, that it was supposed to look in a particular way. And maybe you can even call this an ideal, the ideal of the, the carved camel, and which might not have to have been the same as the ideal of uh, a real camel. And I think this, on the one hand, this might seem self-evident that there was a certain convention in the rock art, <clears throat> but it's not so much when we look at what we know about the societies and about the rock art in general, um, because, these, like I said, these societies, we know very little about them, and um, we don't even know that they were one ethnic group or one cultural group. We know they wrote Safietic, but that, that says nothing. Yet, from a rock art perspective, we're getting the idea that there was some sort of level of communication or interaction, um, whether that was active or passive, which, was, which helped uh, create and maybe maintain a, a convention, a tradition in the way that the rock art was carved. And um, then what the rock art actually means is, is obviously the second step. Um, I think that this definitely suggests that it wasn't just pure graffiti, uh, as has been suggested so many times before, because why would, you, um, why would you have conventions and standards and why would you plan something if you're just doodling for your own sake? Um, but I'm not in the I'm not at this is the next step yet of deciding then what it was. So that'll you'll have to ask me about that in a few years. <laughs> uh, but I think what is clear is that if we look at this uh, these societies instead of taking this top down external approach, but we get a bottom up approach where we look detailed at the rock art, we look at the technique, we look at the chen apportoir, and in this way try to understand the process of carving. Uh, these images better but at the same time I think we cannot forget the image so we can't just sort of throw out uh, the image and the art altogether because we need to consider the aesthetic properties we need to consider uh, the fact that for example it's these camels that are always made in this particular way and they're the most dominant motif so that can't be insignificant so in this sense I think we need to combine these two ways this materiality of the rock art but also continue to consider the image and the aesthetic. And um, well, I hope that in this way, we can get towards a better understanding of these elusive desert societies. Thank you very much.